Good morning and welcome to Canterbury Presbyterian Church. It's a joy to be with you this morning uh, we, as we look at God's Word, continuing to look from Hebrews this week, chapter 7, uh, from verses 11 to 22. And may the Lord encourage you through all that we do this morning, uh, through what we sing, what we pray about, and the things that we hear from His Word. Hear the call to worship from Psalm 147, verses 1 to 6. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. Today in our morning service, we are continuing to consider the supremacy of Christ and the accompanying awe and assurance we have in approaching God through Christ alone. It is with boldness and humility that we come before him. And so let us do that now in another prayer adapted from a Puritan prayer from the Valley of Vision. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, you are most gracious. Another week has gone and you have preserved our going out and our coming in. Yours has been the vigilance that has turned threatened evils aside. Yours the supplies that have nourished us. Yours the comforts that have satisfied us. Yours the relations and friends that have delighted us. Yours the means of grace which have edified us. Yours the book, which amidst all our enjoyments has told us that this world is not our rest, that in all success one thing alone is needful, to love our Saviour. Your innumerable mercies have more than matched our imperfections and sins. These, O oh God, we neither conceal nor lessen, but confess with the quietness of a broken heart. Our Lord, in what condition would secret reviews of our lives leave us, were it not for the assurance that with you there is bountiful redemption, that you are the forgiving God, that you may be feared, and so we humbly ask your mercy, that you would forgive us. While we look to Jesus for pardon through the blood of the cross, we pray to be clothed also with humility, to be quickened in your way, to be more devoted to you, to keep the end of mortal life in view, to be cured of the folly of delay and indecision, to know how frail each of us are, that we would number our days and apply our hearts to wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Hear and know the word of assurance from the Holy Spirit through Psalm 147, verses 17 to 18. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him, he also hears their cry and saves them. In 1738, Charles Wesley, the writer of our first hymn, was not only plagued by doubts about the Christian faith, but was also taken very ill with a painful lung condition known as pleurisy. He was nursed back to health by a group of Christians who also bore faithful testimony to Christ. This impacted Wesley greatly to bring his awakening to the faith. On the first anniversary in 1739, Wesley wrote a commemorative hymn. It was published in 1740 to the name For the Anniversary Day of One's Conversion. Over time, it took its name from the first line of the seventh verse, O oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Originally, it was 18 verses long. 
we all sing just for this morning. May the Lord enrich your heart greatly in the singing of O for a Thousand Tongues. Before we move into our time of announcements, there's some updates from our missionaries. Uh, firstly, from the Seymours. Uh, they've said that they're grateful for the opportunity con to continue most of their outreach ministry via Zoom meetings. Uh, they're holding larger outreach meetings once, a, uh, sorry, twice a month, where their volunteers combine games and small group conversation practice via individual breakout rooms. A, Bible, a bilingual Bible message is also shared, and from these contexts, they've seen contacts. They've seen a number of guests enter into Bible studies, so we praise God for that. Shireen does a weekly Bible study with two seeking young ladies who have returned to Japan, and Greg has a number of men who also study English and, and the Bible with him. Additionally, they've been encouraging and training local volunteers to commence Bible studies. Uh, which is starting to happen, and uh, continue to pray that it would happen more. Andrew in Japan has said this, Dear Canterbury family, I hope you're well amidst all the coronavirus restrictions and changes to life. I've been struck a lot at how weak I've been during this, this pandemic, not to mention in the KGK Bible studies, just trying to keep up. It's definitely challenging my Japanese level, and sometimes I can feel disheartened. But my supervisor has always been encouraging and saying even my participation is so encouraging to the students. So please pray for my persistence and being okay with being weak. Uh, also, he's asked uh, for prayer for supporters uh, for his financial situation. So please be in prayer for Andrew about those things. He's also said that his church is this morning tentatively trying to restart in person, physically, distanced uh, services, as well as... Uh, through the new media's, media team's great efforts, the first online streaming of their church service. Please pray that it would go smoothly and be encouraging to all. 
Jane has written and said, please give thanks for a really refreshing retreat, which she had at home this past week. It was great to spend quality time with the Lord. I feel refreshed and re-energised for the coming semester of ministry. Please pray that the Lord will help me with my talk for our Melbourne Uni International Student Group on how Jesus saves us. Also, please pray for a new project I'm working on, which is uh, how best to care for our international students once they return to their home countries. And Daryl and Sayun in South Korea have written this. Hi, everyone at Canterbury. Thanks so much for all your prayers and support for missions throughout the world, as well as for us here in South Korea. Here, life is getting a little more back to normal. Ethan and Marley started kindergarten again last week after a three-month break, and they're really enjoying seeing their friends and teachers again each day. And at MTI, we're beginning to make plans to restart our missionary training for our autumn semester as people continue to apply for training. It's wonderful to see that even in the midst of a pandemic, God is still calling people and wanting to prepare them for his gospel work. Please pray for wisdom as we consider how to physically distance well within the one building and also for many of our short-term teachers as they consider the possibility of international travel to and from Korea in the coming months. Uh, thank you to our missionaries for your updates. It's a, it's a joy to be able to um, keep in touch and to be able to pray for you and support you. As far as announcements are concerned, again, we have our a Zoom prayer meeting every Sunday morning from quarter to ten to quarter past ten. Please email me if you'd like to join that. And I'll be also sending out another Zoom link for greetings about 20 minutes after the end of the final hymn. And so it will expire after 40 minutes duration. Uh, getting to the Heart of Parenting course over Zoom... Uh, it is free of charge. There are 10, 25-minute sessions exploring and applying biblical wisdom to parenting. The first se session will be commencing Tuesday the 16th of June at 7.30, and then follow-up sessions will proceed fortnightly. Uh, please let me know if you would like to join in with that. And uh, we do have a clip for that, an interview, I think, coming up. No, I'll just go through the next announcement while the team... Get that organised. Uh, please let me know if you'd like to be part of that uh, excellent course. It really has Ted, both Paul Tripp and his brother Ted, uh, are excellent in applying uh, biblical wisdom uh, in a very uh, practical way. And they, uh, they really have a, a great wealth of knowledge to share. And it, it, it would be my joy to be able to... Um, include you in that uh, online course. Uh, yes, we've got um, Paul Tripp uh, giving a brief interview about uh, parenting. My job is, as a parent, is not only to... Uh, teach my children, these are the things you're, you're supposed to do, but teach my children that they're supposed to be part of God's mission as well. It's not just that I raise obedient children, I want to raise kingdom-minded children as well. And so we want to have that conversation early, that our home doesn't belong to us, our possessions don't belong to us. This is not our little private domain where we shut the door and we shut the world out and we do all the selfish things we want to do, uh, but even our most private spaces belong to the Lord. They belong for His use. Your, your toys don't belong to you, but they belong to God. They're, they're there for His use. How can we use the good things that you have uh, to bless and minister to others? So that mentality that all of this belongs to the Lord. I think the best prayer for a family to pray is this. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Not our kingdom come, our will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done right here, right now, in this house. Right here, right now, in this toy room. Right here, right now, in this marriage. And from day one, develop, disciple that mentality into your children. Good morning, church. Uh, it's now time for Old Testament reading. 
And the reading is from Psalm 110. Psalm 110. And I will read from ESV. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion uh, your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power. In holy garments from the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord was sworn and will not ch change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. And he will shatter chiefs of the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the, by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Amen. Now it is time for pray for others. So let us draw near to God in prayer once again. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are holy in all your works and you are a God of absolute integrity. And we come before you uh, with a humble heart uh, in the sense of our own sinfulness. All, all things are naked and exposed before you and even the secret thoughts and intents of our hearts are fully known by you. And for this reason, uh, we humbly confess that uh, we have walked uh, in, the way of your, in the way of our own hearts and do what was pleasing in the sight of our own eyes, uh, continually fulfilling the desires of the flesh and self-pleasing mind. But we thank you that uh, despite our shame and sinfulness, uh, in all your dealing with us, uh, you have been gracious, merciful, and slow to anger. So instead of dealing with us according to our sin, uh, we thank you that you have blessed us uh, by the work of your Holy Spirit to lead us to repentance. And we thank you uh, that we are also justified freely uh, by your grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus from all our sins. And we also thank you that by your grace uh, we can turn away from our idols of worship and worship the true living God on this Lord's day. So we humbly ask that as we gather here virtually to worship your holy name, uh, please make all your goodness to pass before us and we, that we may taste and see that the Lord is good. And we also thank you for this wonderful privilege and gift of prayer as well. And as Paul, Apostle Paul reminds us in Romans chapter five that uh, when we are justified by, uh, by his blood, uh, this also means uh, we now have received reconciliation and therefore have fellowship with God. And we thank you that through Christ uh, in the spirit, uh, we can freely approach the throne of grace in times of need. So we humbly ask uh, you would give ear to our supplications and answer our prayer in your faithfulness. And Heavenly Father, for this reason, we continue to pray for our nation uh, suffering from COVID-19 situation. Uh, we thank you again that uh, this virus is really under control and we thank you uh, for your kind provision that we can receive medical support and financial support uh, through the caring government. And uh, we pray as we slowly begin to lift the lockdown, uh, you would guard our nation and the people from the second wave. And we see, although COVID-19 may seem under control, we still see uh, difficult times uh, is still lying ahead. Uh, we see the increasing tension between China and Western countries, and we also see Australia is, is, is in recession for the first time in 30 years. Uh, few, only a few months ago, in the beginning of year 2020, uh, we never expected these things to happen, and we see how this world can change so quickly uh, because of the virus. And we indeed learn that uh, we are living in a fallen world which is far from perfect. 
But on the other hand, we thank you that you have given us the hope of resurrection and the hope of heaven uh, through our risen Lord. And we really pray that through this difficult time, uh, we would turn our eyes from the vain glories of this world and engage our thoughts and hearts in the hope we have in Christ. So as we see about Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, even though he went through a lot of suffering and hardship, uh, we see he still greatly rejoiced uh, in grace. And we learn from that that true happiness and joy are not really based on our circumstances. It is not really a matter of whether we are poor or rich, but we see that uh, our true happiness and contentment can only be found in God, for you are the only fountain of every blessing. So we pray in this difficult time, help us, help us not to lose heart, but help us to seek you uh, in our weakness and enjoy greater peace and comfort that can be only found in you. And we also pray for the practical need of our brothers and sisters at Canterbury. Uh, we pray for those who have lost their job. Uh, we pray um, you would continue to provide uh, their daily need and help us to be mindful and care caring of those who are suffering uh, from this pandemic as well. And we also pray for those who are suffering from sickness as well. Um, we have few members uh, who recently had surgery and we especially pray for John Mill, uh, who had back surgery uh, a few days ago. Um, help her to seek you in her weakness more than doctors, knowing that the issue of life and death belongs to you. And we thank you that uh, the surgery went well. And we really pray that uh, the surgery uh, would be effective to improve her condition. And we pray um, you would restore her to full health. And we also pray for those who are pregnant as well. Uh, we pray for Yumi and Alice that um, going through 10 months of pregnancy uh, could be certainly challenging uh, for them. And we pray that uh, you, they would be strong to continue in faith. And we pray they would ina you would enable them to cast their burden on you. And under your sovereign care, uh, keep both moms and babies healthy and safe. And we pray... Uh, they would quickly forget the pain from delivering the baby because of the joy uh, that a new life brings into the family. And uh, we uh, pray for the service as well. And as we are now about to listen uh, to your precious word being preached, uh, we pray for our senior minister, David Hahn, and help him, uh, help him with your Holy Spirit to preach your word in boldness and with clarity. And we pray for the congregation that uh, let us never turn a deaf ear from hearing your word and may our hearts be fully committed to you all our days uh, in our worship. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Don. Our second hymn this morning was written in 1757 by the gifted 18th century German poet, university lecturer, but particularly humble Christian man by the name of Christian Gellert. It was originally entitled Jesus Lives With Him I Too, and it was translated in 1841 to be Jesus Lives, The Victories Won. It's set to 19th century British musician Henry Gauntlet's commanding melody. And may the Holy Spirit strengthen you with spiritual joy and confidence in the singing of its even further updated title, providentially encouraging for our unsettling time, Jesus Lives, Thy Terrors Now.
Well, boys and girls, it's that time of the service, so we look forward to bringing God's word to you. Do you remember from two weeks ago what happened while Terry was waiting to celebrate his sixth birthday party? Well, do you remember? Two of Terry's friends and their mummy had to stop by the road because their car broke down. Do you remember the children? Hello, boys, Hello, and, boys girls. and girls. We're Dear Morris and Doris. Doris. Do, Do you remember us? Remember also, boys and girls, that Doris and Boris's mummy, Loris, she rang Terry's mummy, Hilda, to tell her what had happened and to tell Hilda how sorry they were for not being able to make it to the party. While the car was still smoking and Loris was on the phone, Boris and Doris had wandered away. The problem was, boys and girls, that just that very morning, Boris and Doris's mummy, Loris, had said, Boris and Doris, if we have to stop along the way, you aren't to be wandering off. Do you understand? Boris and Doris understood and told their mummy that they had understood and that they would obey. Well, Boris and Doris were feeling sad about not being able to go to Terry's party. So they went looking to have some fun of their own and they found it. It immediately brought a smile to Doris's face and a smile to Boris's face. It was a great big muddy puddle. Now, having fun with mud has its place. But the problem was, boys and girls, that not only had they disobeyed their mummy by wandering off, but just that very morning, their mummy had also said, Boris and Doris, you're in your best clothes, so today you aren't to be playing in the mud. Do you understand? Boris and Doris had understood and told their mummy that they had understood and that they would obey. I wonder what they were going to do, boys and girls. Well, while their mummy was distracted, Boris... And Doris, as well, wasted no time getting to the muddy puddle. Boris was the first to go to the muddiest part of the muddy puddle. And there he stopped, briefly thought about what his mummy had said, and then decided again that he just wanted to do what he wanted to do. And so with that, he laid down in the muddy puddle and even began to roll around in the muddy puddle. Dear, oh dear, boys and girls, I wonder what Doris was going to do. Well, she waited and then briefly also thought about what Mummy had said. She'd seen Boris, her brother, rolling around in the mud and then decided also that she wanted to do what he was doing and what she wanted to do. So with that, she went to an equally muddy part of the puddle as well. There she lay down in the muddy puddle and even began to roll around in the muddy puddle like Boris. Dear, oh dear. I wonder how Boris and Doris looked after playing in the mud, boys and girls. Here they are. Is that Boris or is it Doris? It's hard to tell with all that mud. Is that Doris or is it Boris? It's hard to tell with all that mud. Well, after their mummy got off the phone, she went searching for her children. And then she spotted them. Her upset face turned to horrified. And she let out a gasp. Oh, no. There before her very eyes stood her muddy, disobedient children. Well, thankfully nearby, a kind gardener and his assistant let Loris a hose with warm water. And then Loris hosed off all the mud. They were wet but clean. Eventually, it took a while, boys and girls. They were clean on the outside, but there was actually a much bigger problem on the inside. 
They were what you might say dirty on the inside because they had disobeyed their mummy. And in disobeying their mummy, Boris and Doris had disobeyed God. Well, after cleaning off her children on the outside and drying them, of course, Loris explained to Doris what was wrong on the inside in her heart. Loris said that when she said no to her command, that she was really saying no to God. The Bible calls that sin. Well, that's why the other sinful things happen. When one says no to God to start with, other things come into one's heart like being angry for selfish reasons, having tantrums, being greedy, fighting, being mean and talking in class, telling lies, being jealous, and disobeying parents. And these were just to name a few. Loris also explained to Boris what was wrong on the inside, in his heart. Loris said that when Boris said no to her command, that he was really saying no to God. And the Bible calls that sin. That's why the other sinful things happened. Things like being angry for selfish reasons, having tantrums, being greedy, fighting, being mean and talking in class, telling lies, being jealous, and disobeying parents. And these were just to name a few. Well, Loris explained the great news that when Jesus died on the cross, anyone who trusts him as the boss, that is the king, the ruler, and the one who saves, before God, he takes away the punishment for sin. So all the things, saying no to God, being angry for selfish reasons, having tantrums, being greedy, disobeying, uh, fighting, stealing, being mean and talking in class, telling lies, being jealous and fighting and many more other things we show that when we sin. Loris also told her children that God forgives us when we trust Jesus and that though we still sin, even after we trust Jesus, when we trust him, he promises also to help us not to sin. Well, boys and girls, though they couldn't go to Terry's party, Though they'd been disobedient and gotten very dirty on the outside and the inside, the day ended the best way that it could have ended because Boris and Doris said sorry and asked Jesus to be their saviour and their Lord, that is, their boss or their king. Then the roadside assist eventually arrived, fixed their car and on the way back home, their mummy played a very special song to remind them that Jesus is the only one who can wash away the dirtiness on the inside that sin causes so that all who trust him are forgiven and clean before God. The song was called, What Can Wash Away My Sin? In fact, boys and girls, we've got it now for us to learn and sing along as well. Let's do that.
Let's pray, boys and girls. Our dear Father God, we thank you that you promise that when we trust Jesus as the one who is our king, as our ruler, as our boss, as the one who is Lord of our lives, and when we trust him as our saviour, the one who saves us from sin, that you promise to wash away all our sin from on the inside. We thank you for his precious death when he shed his blood and that that is what takes away our sin when we stand before you, that we know we are forgiven and free. Please help us to trust Jesus always in his precious name. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7. In the context of the generosity of financial support from other churches, uh, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians saying, As you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. Thank you for your ongoing grace in supporting Canterbury Presbyterian Church. This time in the service is set aside for those who are committed to Canterbury Presbyterian and I invite you to take the time now to give as you have decided in your heart. Or if you are committed to another Bible-believing church and you normally support it week by week, feel free to use this time also to do that. Otherwise, if you're not part of such a church, please let this time pass without obligation. Let's pray. Our Lord, we thank you for the grace of giving, that it is an act of grace, because you are first and foremost the God who owns all and freely gives from out of your abundant grace. Thank you for the gracious servants who give to the work of your kingdom at work here amongst us at Canterbury Presbyterian Church, for those who give to other Christ-centered churches, to compassion ministries and gospel missions throughout the world. May you be pleased to use such tangible grace, both here and wherever it is given, for even more works of grace so that there would be abundant magnification of your glory as it enables more works of service to be undertaken. In Jesus' name, amen. Our next hymn was released in 2010 by the Australian Christian musician Trevor Hodge. The gracious and gifted servants Philip Percival and Alana Glover from EMU Music have recorded a clip to lead us in an uplifting acoustic version of No Other Name. May the Lord prepare our hearts in praise before we hear the word from Hebrews. There is no other name in 
A New Testament Bible reading from the book of Hebrews is taken from chapter 7, verses 11 to 22. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 11 to 22. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than the one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belonged to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek who has become a priest, not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced, through which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. For those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. Before we look more closely at God's word, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we humbly pray that you would help us this morning as we look at this passage, that you would draw us near to you by the power of Christ alone and give us spiritual insight that you would guard my words and guard our ears and hearts, that we would receive your instruction with joy and that you would be pleased to fortify us and help us all the more to know that it is only through grace alone, by the merits of Christ alone, that we can draw near to you. We pray in his name. Amen. So last week we looked at the pattern of Melchizedek's superiority as king and priest who foreshadowed Jesus, who is, of course, our ultimate king and priest. We thought then about patterns and the final fulfillment to which they point. 
This week, the writer of Hebrews continues particularly to compare the pattern of the Old Testament priests known as the Levites with the pattern of the Old Testament priest called Melchizedek. So what practical difference does it make to us living now in the 21st century to believe that the priestly order of Melchizedek is superior to the other ancient line known as the order of the Levites? Well, first of all, it must make practical difference to us because it is in God's word. And we know that the Lord's word is that which doesn't return empty to him. But all the same, you might be tempted to think that it doesn't make much practical difference to me. It all seems a bit confusing. I I really can't see what the point is. Well, here it is. It's in this question that helps us to understand the practical reason that we need to understand the superiority of the order of Melchizedek. What if the fallen spiritual tendency for all of us is to try and rely upon a priesthood apart from Christ? That is a pattern of attempting to draw near to God other than through Jesus Christ alone. If that is true then Hebrews 7 is vitally relevant to turn us away from flawed attempts at being forgiven and cleansed of sin. Uh, Being forgiven and cleansed of sin is the crucial priest-dependent spiritual event that enables anyone to be in relationship with God. And it can happen, even for Christians, very subtly, and is a particular temptation into which we can fall even as we grow in Christian maturity and character. And it easily happens in this way. We become more disciplined with regular devotion, in treating others with patience and grace, in being kind, in showing generosity, in exercising self-control, even simply in having a day-to-day success in overcoming sin and as we grow in the amount and the, of, of godly thoughts, as we become more virtuous. And then one day, we stop and realize that it's been a while since we've confessed our everyday sin to the Lord and asked for his help in the battle against it. And why is that? Could it be that we don't because we think that we don't have that much to confess. Well, the Lord in his kindness doesn't let his children continue for long in that kind of thinking. His Holy Spirit graciously shows us that pride and self-righteousness like a parasite, because very rarely in such cases do we think we've been proud or self-righteous. We think we've been virtuous, and then pride attaches itself to that virtue, to the good things that we've been doing, that may well have started off with good intentions as part of our loving response to our gracious Lord, but somewhere along the way became the wrong means. Subconsciously, we've begun to think our virtue was giving us access to God. Well, though the context and the circumstances are different to ours nearly 2,000 years later, a central spiritual question remains. What pseudo-priestly attempts at drawing near to God am I at risk of making? What false attempts at being forgiven and cleansed and so drawing near to God am I making? It's that very issue over which the recipients of the letter to the Hebrews were tempted to go astray. Having seemed to receive and believe the gospel message of Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour, and being from a Jewish background, the new believers were being dangerously fooled into thinking that the sacrifices they made that had been part of the Old Testament law were still needed to atone for, that is, to remove their guilt from sin, to stand forgiven and free before God. Part of this was that they still believed that the descendants of Levi, who had been the priestly line of Israel, still represented the authorised mediators to make atonement. 
that had been the point of the Old Testament priesthood that had been instituted by God for a time under the order of Levi in the Old Testament law. But when Jesus Christ came, he fulfilled the law and the prophets and he abolished the sacrificial system. Those had been the patterns, the types, the shadows, the signposts set down by God to point to his coming. And what were the Hebrews wanting to do? They were wanting to depend on the patterns rather than the reality in Christ. Well, we aren't so different. When we revert to the other means of trying to draw near to God, we show that we have the same spiritual issue, the same flawed approach. Well, the Lord's intent in this passage is for us as well to behold the awesome plan of God as we see the proof of the ultimate superiority of Melchizedek's order completed in Christ, that we would turn from any other attempt which we may come up with or that may be offered to us at drawing near to God and turn back to Christ alone, the one who is supreme. The Hebrews needed to know that even in regard to the pattern of the Old Testament priestly line, that there was one prior to Levi's order that also surpassed Levi's order. Verse 11. Now if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than the one named after the order of Aaron? In chapter 14 of Genesis, we remember that Abraham met king, the king of Salem, that over the next 500 years, that city became known as Jerusalem. That king was also a priest of God, Melchizedek, king of righteousness. That event was around 2000 BC, and God didn't give the Old Testament law to Moses and the priesthood to his brother Aaron, both of whom were grandsons to Levi, for more than 500 years from that time when Abram met Melchizedek. Then 500 years after that time of the giving of the law, that is, 1,000 years after Melchizedek met Moses, Melchizedek's name appeared once more in the Old Testament from the reading that Don gave to us. That was around 1,000 BC, Psalm 110 of King David, a king of the same city, that became known as Jerusalem. David wrote about the priest after the order of Melchizedek, who was also David's Lord, who rules at the right hand of the Almighty Lord, making him equal with God. God purposefully set up the Levitical priesthood as a pattern, so that getting to the heart of sin and its guilt would only ever be foreshadowed until perfection arrived in Christ. That's the reason that God established Melchizedek as a superior pattern long before Levi. The Hebrew Christians had been tempted to find the ultimate path to moral and spiritual perfection to being right with God in an inferior order. Obviously inferior because great King David prophesied about the Lord being a priest from Melchizedek's order, his Lord. When that new and ultimate priest was to come forward, the system of law had to change. It's the point he now makes in verse 12. For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. It seems that Jesus died and rose most likely early April around 30 AD, the time of the Jewish festival of Passover. At that time, the law changed in the sense that there were to be no more Old Testament types of priests. That is, the kind that represented the people to God by dealing with their guilt through confession and making the specified sacrifice to atone for that guilt. Jesus transformed the temple in dying and rising. He became the place where guilt uh, was and is atoned the building in Jerusalem was about to be destroyed, never to rise. It happened in 70 AD, being around 40 years after, almost to the day of Jesus' death. 
As Jesus predicted in Matthew, Mark and Luke's gospel accounts, the Romans destroyed it along with Jerusalem, 70 AD. And when Jesus laid down his life as the perfect sacrifice, he fulfilled the law. He completed the priesthood as the perfect priest who by the sacrifice of his own body would become the embodiment of the temple, the only place where the guilt of sin could be wiped clean. That pattern of Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, Jesus fulfilled. It had to arise separately to the line of Levi through Aaron to show that the Old Testament type was temporary and set to give way for the ultimate, perfect and eternal found in Christ alone. Verse 13, for the one of whom these things are spoken belonged to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. In connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. The one of whom these things are spoken is, of course, Jesus. That Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3 make clear with their genealogies was a direct descendant from one of Levi's brothers, the one who founded the southern tribe of Judah, from whom David and all the kings of Judah would descend. The problem was that how could Jesus truly be said to be the ultimate priest when he wasn't even from the priestly line of Levi, especially since Moses, the great leader and author of the Old Testament law under God, never mentioned the member of another tribe as a priest. Though Moses also was a pattern that pointed to Christ, on the matter of the priesthood arising from Judah, it wasn't necessary in God's scheme for him to mention it. To have mentioned it. For verse 15, this becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest, not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. The sense in which this other priest has arisen in the likeness of the Old Testament pattern who was Melchizedek is not as the order of the Aaronic or Levitical priests, but by fulfilment of his never-ending life. As mentioned in last week's sermon, the Old Testament never records the genealogy of Melchizedek, nor does it document his death. Unlike Levi... Aaron and the Levitical priests. As far as the Old Testament record is concerned, Melchizedek, as verse 3 says, had neither beginning of days nor end of life. That contrasts with Aaron, where in the book of Numbers, chapter 20, verses 28 and 29, we read that Moses removed Aaron's garments and put them on his son Eleazar. And Aaron died there on top of the mountain. Then Moses and Eleazar came down from the mountain And when the whole community learned that Aaron had died, all the Israelites mourned for him 30 days. In Joshua chapter 24, verse 33, we read also about Aaron's son Eleazar's death. That, at the very least, made Melchizedek a pattern of the Lord in Psalm 110, who was present in 1000 BC as the eternal Son of God, and who entered our world in the first century as the incarnate Son of God who by the power of his resurrection proved that he is indestructible and remains alive today, alive forever. Is not the power of an indestructible life the great longing for which we all hope, but that which death mocks? Sometimes we unwittingly begin to think we are indestructible, only to be shaken when the Lord confronts us with our own frailty or the breakdown of relationships or the mortality, the death of those we love. The solid grip on life we thought we had is suddenly revealed to be fragile and subject to be torn away at any time. We carry all manner of sorrows because we don't 
have indestructible lives. And if we've yet to experience great sadness, it can be more tempting to think that our happy state will continue the same way it always has. Relationships thriving and continuing uninterrupted for an indefinite time. None of us ever want to think that such blessings will ever end. But when the reality of the frailty of life visits us, God humbles us and points us again to this fact. The only indestructible life is Jesus Christ, who died and rose never to die again. His eternal priesthood, according to Melchizedek, means that he lives forever to speak an infinitely better word of hope, to cleanse us from guilt, to stand before God, forgiven and free, and only then be indestructible. Because he is the first fruits of indestructibility, we have hope, eternal hope. But in and of ourselves, our mortality mocks us. And yet it drives us to the cross and the resurrection, the empty tomb of our Lord Jesus, our great King and High Priest. The Old Testament Levitical priesthood was an inferior shadow of this ultimate reality that Jesus came to bring. As verse 18 we read, For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced, through which we draw near to God. The writer now compares this change of law in summary form a former commandment. It's the sacrificial system with its priests and rituals initially in the tent of meeting under Moses' brother Aaron around 1450 BC and then 500 years later in 950 BC in the temple built by David's son King Solomon where the priests descended from Levi continued to serve. The writer says it is now set aside because of its weakness and uselessness and clarifies what he means by saying that the law made nothing perfect. It wasn't weak and useless because God and his provision of the law were deficient, but because it was deliberately not meant to perfect believers through the cleansing of their consciences in order for them to be confident in drawing near to God. It was only a signpost it was a temporary setup, and those who drew near to God could only look forward to the great coming of the one who would perfect that which they looked, to which they looked forward. The key purpose of the law, as Paul said in Romans 3.20, was to make us conscious of sin. In Galatians 3, he also compared the law to a schoolmaster or a guardian, the purpose of which was effective for showing the degree of offence and prescribing the punishment. Well, the law functions in a similar way today. If the sign says I'm driving in a 60 kilometre zone and I'm caught doing 75 kilometres per hour, the authorities make me aware that I've transgressed more than 10 kilometres per hour and I receive a notice, a penalty, to say I've lost three demerit points and must pay $330 unless there are extraneous circumstances that are valid. Well, as we read through the Old Testament law, we see that it was God's standard. When it was broken, it also had its punishments and its priests who made animal sacrifices to show that sin was costly and messy. It was God's temporary means of dealing with sin that were only intended to be temporary so that they could point to the greater in and of itself, as Hebrews says here, it was useless to affect a change of heart. It's why we see the pattern throughout the Old Testament of, of those who were in Israel continuing to sin, continuing that pattern of needing atonement, continuing to be forgiven. It wasn't meant to perfect their consciences. If in, in fact, if anything, it was meant to highlight sin's horrible guilt. And in doing that, point to the great hope of the coming priest who would bring the much-needed change 
to deal with our sin and guilt that comes from it once and for all. Jesus brings certain hope that not even the greatest of Old Testament priests could affect. A heart washed clean of all guilt because of the sacrifice he made in laying down his perfect life and in that death, the ultimate high priest's work. To take the punishment that a holy God justly requires and in his resurrection, to give assurance to all who hand their lives over to his eternal rule, who will ourselves inherit an indestructible future as we draw near to God. That's a guarantee greater than anything the Old Testament priests were able to provide. All they could do was be signposts to point to the great one coming, the greatest one. In verse 20, it was not without an oath we read, for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. In the second book of the Old Testament, Exodus, in chapter 28, verse 1, God simply commanded Moses to bring his brother Aaron and his sons, they were the Levites, to serve as priests. There was no oath surrounding the Levitical priesthood. There was no oath surrounding priesthood until David says it of his own Lord in Psalm 121, Psalm 110, sorry, who in verse 21 uh, quotes it in, re, in contrast as continuing Melchizedek's order. In this chapter, in verse 21, we read, One was made a priest with an oath, by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn, that is the making of an oath, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. In other words, King David recorded God saying those very words as an oath on his own Lord, David's Lord, who is our Lord Jesus. This brings us back to the sure hope that God's oath brings as it rests upon the eternal Son, Jesus Christ as our eternal priest. Verse 22, this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The guarantor, the underwriter of a covenant of this legally binding promise is the one who binds himself to the contract. And here the author of Hebrews urges us to consider Christ the one with boundless resources who by his death has paid the infinite price to make the only way possible for anyone to draw near to God. That is the covenant reality for those who trust Jesus as Lord and Saviour. The author of Hebrews gives us great assurance in this covenant reality for those who draw near to God only through the merits of Christ. One of the things I remember my parents teaching me as a child or saying to me was a promise is only as strong as the person who makes it. A promise is only as strong as the person who makes it. And when we consider Christ, there is no one greater than him as the ultimate priest who fulfilled the order of the king of righteousness. A king who was the priest who met Abraham 3,000 years ago in the city that would become Jerusalem. He is the one who fulfilled that order. The reality to which Melchizedek's pattern pointed rode into that same city 1,990 years ago to seal the promise of forgiveness by his blood for all who would trust him. The priest who gave that ultimate sacrifice also triumphs by an indestructible life. We cannot behold the supremacy of Christ uh, with too great a regard. As we devote ourselves daily to embracing his incomparability, we will know with greater certainty this fact that we are able to draw near to God only through Jesus Christ, both now and and forever, it can't be anything else, not our virtue, not even our devotion, but by the merits of Christ alone. Let's pray.
our Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ and for the grace that comes from him freely, abundantly, perfectly. Lord, we pray that you would help us to turn away from any sense in which we think our virtue is that which makes us acceptable to you and help us to confess regularly and to fall again at the foot of the cross, knowing that the empty tomb also speaks the ultimate word of hope by the one who died and rose, our perfect king and priest. We pray in his precious name. Amen. And now let's continue to meditate on uh, what we've heard through nothing but the blood. What can wash away my sin? Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 to 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Our final reflection hymn for the praise of our Lord was only released last year, by the team at Sovereign Grace Music and is a blessing to help us reflect on the supremacy of our Lord that makes his grace and mercy our great assurance. 
We look forward to streaming our Sunday at 5 service to you this afternoon. Thank you for joining us, and may you be encouraged in the singing of Jesus, your mercy. Bye.